You see, on the one side is Left 4 Dead, with its smooth, cohesive 4-player co-op gameplay, friends by circumstance struggling together in a world overrun by zombies and monsters. And here, on the other side, we have Warhammer 40k, with its totally modest storytelling. All of humanity struggling together in a galaxy overrun by aliens, zombies, heretics, demons, and literal gods. Put those two sides together, and it's a hell of a fun mix. In the realms of zombie slasher co-op games, Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide may be the best thing since Left 4 Dead. This is an easy price to claim, however, since the previous attempt by the creators of Left 4 Dead was such a dud. Dark Tide, set in one of my favorite science fiction universes, is the breath of fresh air I needed after I was so thoroughly disappointed by Back for Blood one year ago. So believe me when I say, I really like this game, but I have a hard time loving it. Life service games really don't make that easy. But now, prepare thyselves, for we are going to explore the great and not so great aspects of Warhammer 40k Dark Tide. I have segmented this video into several parts, which you can see in the timeline at the bottom of the video, because to fully explore this game we need to attack it from several angles. The sections could be called the good, the badass and the ugly. And the ugly part is a part plaguing way too many modern games and this is the area where old games like Left 4 Dead will always have the upper leg, but more about that at the appropriate time. So if you do not care about the universe in which the game is set and purely care about the gameplay, then skip ahead to the indicated time. We'll see you over there. And for the rest, let's dive a bit into Warhammer 40k. Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide is of course set in the eponymous Warhammer 40k universe, Games Workshop's flagship franchise that in its roots revolves around a tabletop game system, which was my introduction into this theme of science fiction stories and games. And I think to fully appreciate Dark Tide, you should at least know a little bit about 40k, as the game is heavily bound into that universe. Let me give you a quick intro with a quote. It is the 41st millennium. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. The Emperor of Mankind wages a constant battle to protect humanity from the horrors of space. On the fringes of the Imperium, alien races lurk and plot, and chaos demons leak into our reality from the torment of the warp. All that stands in their way are the mighty Space Marines, and may I add, all the other countless organizations of the Imperium, and one of these organizations is the Imperial Inquisition. Just imagine the historical Inquisition paired with a secret service of sorts. And in Dark Tide, we are a wrongly convicted criminal given the chance to prove our worth to an Inquisitor in his quest to rid a gigantic city, the Hive City of Tertium, of a chaos infestation. Large parts of the city willingly, or most likely unwillingly, joined the forces of chaos, lured in with false promises by the Dark Gods. In our case here, it seems to be primarily the god of Nurgle, the god of life, who has a hand in all this corruption. And yeah, the god of life in 40k is maybe not what you imagined him to be. Papa Nurgle isn't exactly a uh, sexy boy. Nature is amazing. And just for the record, there are other chaos gods as well, like Korn, the god of blood, or Slanesh, the god of lust. I guess they picked Nurgle for this game as his followers are the most disgusting and his demons are the most ugly, and I suppose the game wouldn't fly so well with some ratings boards if they had us slaughter big booby succubi demons and, I don't know, the god of lust tries to tempt you with whatever you find enjoyable. Hmm. Enter your kinks to finish character creation. Holy! You look at the size of them! Uh, let's just say the game was well rooted deep in 40k lore. 
The game's own story narrative, however, that's something to discuss later. Also, forgive me if I am not 100% on point with the law, I'm stuck somewhere in 5th edition. But back in the day, oh, back in the day, this was my friends and I rolling into a games workshop. Hi there. Is there a project you're working on? I know more than you. All right. And now onwards to the main part, the gameplay. There are a lot of games which try to take the gameplay formula established by Valve's Left 4 Dead and try to bend and adapt it to their needs, with varying success. For example, World War Z tried to be a Left 4 Dead alike with a movie license and that worked fairly fine. So eventually the developer Fat Shark came along and said, guys, we can do that too. Give us whatever license Games Workshop has to offer and we turn that into a game. Building upon the Left 4 Dead formula to a point where calling it a Left 4 Dead clone isn't fair anymore. After their proof of concept in the Warhammer Fantasy universe with Vermintide 1 and 2, they took the tide into the 41st millennium with a gigantic bang. Fundamentally, this is a modern first-person shooter with all the bells and whistles you would expect nowadays. Jumping over obstacles, sprinting and all that nice stuff. If you played any first-person shooter in the past 15 years, you will probably find yourself at home here. Presently, there are four classes available in Darktide. The Veteran, also called Sharpshooter, is, as you may have guessed, the main shooting class and is what would correspond the most with a vanilla FPS protagonist. He has a special ability to ignore suppressing fire, allowing him to take out faraway opponents that are particularly nasty, like a sniper or machine gunner. The Zealot Preacher is less of a shooty one, more of a shouty one. While still being able to handle a bolter, the skills are more favorable for getting past the enemy and taking on specific enemies in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Their special ability is to charge right through big groups of opponents, great for getting into and also out of a dicey situation. The Ogryn is, as you might have guessed, the tank class, able to take massive punishment, but also able to hand it right back. While not such a graceful shot, the Ogryn makes for a veritable battering ram when plowing through enemies like, well, a plow. Playing this class is really an interesting experience, as you are a lot taller than any other player and most enemies even. It's a bit of a different perspective on the world. Last but not least, the Psyker. While not offering such an interesting visual perspective as the Ogryn, it may be the most interesting class to play as, definitely more of a challenging one. You can use firearms like any other class and rely on your psychic abilities purely as a backup to use on occasion to take out some longer range target. But that would probably be a bit of a waste of the special powers granted to this class. Instead of a firearm, this class can choose a staff. You can hit people with it, sure, makes for a nice bonk, but you can also shoot psychic energy with it or take out large groups at once. And here comes the part that makes this class a bit challenging. You have to be weary of how much power you use, as straining yourself too much can get yourself killed. In case of emergency, use your special ability, lowering the strain on your mind instantly and releasing a psychic shockwave pushing away opponents that are immediately around you. While these classes are specialists in their field, depending on the equipment, everyone can fulfill most roles if they are in a pinch. Most weapons can be used by every class, with the Ogryn of course forming an exception because the Ogryn is just too big to use a normal gun. What I want to say is, the classes are very customizable. Even the perks can be chosen freely and can be reset at will. There's no cost involved, you can just mission by mission go and change your loadout and your perks. In addition to the modifiable perks, you also have class specific perks that are just always there. For example, the veteran, the main shooting class, has a constant perk allowing him to always carry 40% more ammunition for the main rifle. And before we continue our look into the gameplay, a word from our sponsor. Papa Nurgle's Breakfast Flakes, now with 20% more fiber. Disgusting, but still tastier than other YouTuber-endorsed breakfast cereal. 
No, no, imagine me getting a sponsor. I got no, no product to shill today, only a Patreon. And with the help of these supporters over there, I'll be able to get a new graphics card soon. Learn why that is necessary later in this video. Now back to the program. Dark Tide sets a large focus on close combat. Therefore, irregardless of class, the first weapon slot is the sword, axe, bully, club or shovel. Anything you can crunch a skull with. The arsenal includes well and lesser known weapons of the 40k universe, even chain axes, although I always associated them more with the Chaos than with Imperium. These weapons can be swung normally and hard, for fast and heavy blows. Some weapons have a special ability, like this hammer. Being able to be charged, it can deal a massive strike, bringing even big enemies to stumble, allowing your teammates to strike them down. The second slot is occupied with, of course, firearms, which, depending on the player, are their primary weapon despite being on the second slot. From the venerable bolter and last gun to revolvers and flamers, the arsenal is large. And as mentioned before, the most basic weapons are available to every class, with exception of the Ogryn. The Ogryn always needs bigger things. Having the Ogryn handle normal human-sized things are, well, it's a sight to behold. Like the swords and hammers, the guns have various different modes. Most LAS guns are straightforward semi-automatic rifles with the ability to use sights. Some, however, can be charged. Others just chew through energy cells with a rate of fire that will make your head spin. This is aerial denial, almost like a flamethrower. This is incredibly controllable. I mean, well, it is just a laser pulse, and as the joke goes, the last scan is a glorified torchlight, and the Imperial assault rifle is not much better. So if a damage dealer is what ye seek, then a bolter is a fine choice. Better yet, a plasma gun. But just like in the tabletop game, be weary of overheating it. It might just blow up in your face. And that is usually something one does not want to happen. Onwards to the next slot. The player has a grenade slot. Fairly self-explanatory, except for the Psyker. Veteran, Preacher and Ogryn each have their own special grenade. Explosive, crowd control and, well, throwing the whole crate. But other than you might expect, throwing the whole crate isn't explosive, it's more a pinpoint accurate strike of blunt force. Boink! Bonk! Thunk! It's goddamn satisfying nailing someone with this thing. <laughs> the Ogren is usually a bit more crowd control focused, but this is a great way of getting rid of a single very annoying person. Just like this guy. <laughs> Pow! Right in the kisser. The Psyker's grenade slot is occupied by a psychic power, this allowing him to let enemies' heads just pop. While grenades usually affect a larger area, this psychic power can be used for a pinpoint strike against a special enemy, incredibly useful at times. The last slot found on your HUD is reserved for pickups, mission-specific items or health and ammo crates for your team. The very last HUD element we are going to take a look at now is this little bar above the actual health bar. This is the toughness of your character, essentially a shield that absorbs damage until it is gone. Your toughness can be recharged by slaying opponents in battle, special perks and unit cohesion. Teams that stick together replenish their toughness shield. Have a look at this situation. I am almost dead, but my toughness shield is full. So even though my life is very low, I am still a tough nut to crack, which allows me to redline my character. With a certain few of the aforementioned perks, it is possible to create a character that becomes the strongest just before they die. I'm almost dead, but still a slasher. Yeah, this is risky gameplay, but also highly rewarding as your damage output maximizes. And anyway, it is better to die for the Emperor than to live for yourself. But remember, this is only possible because of our unit cohesion. Sticking close together is generally a good idea. Players that stray too far away from the group are easily overwhelmed. And in such cases, rushing to them, helping your friends stand up when they are down on the ground, overwhelmed by enemies, or dangling off a cliff, always indeed a good idea. 
Even accidents happen. Explosive barrels are not a rare sight. They can be dangerous, because they throw you around quite a fair bit. So, uh, don't overdo it like I did. Otherwise, you may accidentally kill your own teammate for good. Here is Munition A. Our veteran has <laughs> wieder money. Sag mal. Ah, we seem to be short von Ogren. All in good fun. When you do lose one for good, you can retrieve them. The game just assumes they have been taken prisoner by the cultists and you can free them at a point further up ahead. A system just like in Left 4 Dead. Though Left 4 Dead did it a bit better with freeing them from some room they are trapped in. Here they just spawn kneeling on the ground waiting for you. Usually with one or two captors, but sometimes even without captors and then they're just sitting there on their own. Nothing would keep them from escaping. So they just sit there even if you stand right next to them. To be honest, they could have done this a bit better. Regardless, be sure to get your teammates back, because only together you can take a stand against all the different enemies you will be encountering. These range from your usual mindless zombie-like infested maggot spewing scum to more organized chaos cultists who shoot back at you, use cover, retreat and outflank you on occasion. Added into the mix of regular opponents are specialized enemies. These special enemies can be pretty nasty if they ambush you. But if you pay attention you can avoid that. If not drowned out by the noise of battle, special opponents are being teased with an audio cue. These come in the form of a loud roar or the sound of the ignition of a flamethrower. Snipers reveal themselves with a bright laser pointer. On their own, these special enemies can be taken on easily. But if several special enemies strike together, it requires teamwork to take down whatever the hordes of chaos throw at you. Flamethrowers and machine gunners and ragers that knock you over, dogs jumping on you and of course enemy ogrins. Who at first may appear like a little boss, but believe me, they are no boss enemies. You have several mid-level bosses that can appear by random. Like the demon host, in function working like the witch in Left 4 Dead. If you come too close or shoot it, it will take out your team, one by one. Unless you manage to kill it, and that can, depending on the difficulty, be a rather hard task. The Plague Ogryn is one particularly lucky fella blessed by the god of life. So be sure to outrun it and pump it full of lead. One fellow that's even more handsome is the Beast of Nurgle. A disgusting slug-like creature that spits pus-like vomit at you. Stay away from it, don't step in it and don't get spat on. And don't go too close to that thing anyways, you may get eaten. Because as you know, it is the 41st millennium and there is only Vor. I hope you entered that into your kink sheet upon character creation. <laughs> Otherwise you won't have a fun time. Besides the mid-level bosses, you do have end-level bosses from time to time that work as you would expect them to. They are just a bit more versatile than the mid-level guys. Let me also include the demonic growths into this list. Not exactly a boss, but they do often appear in the end battles and have to be destroyed while you get swamped by massive hordes of regular enemies. So in a way, they are a mini kind of end boss. These are the opponents that you will encounter on the various missions that all follow a similar structure, but often allow you to choose diverting paths over at times really large open areas to avoid or flank enemies. Unlike in Left 4 Dead and similar games where mere survival is the main goal, you enter the battlefield to reach a target location to recover some important piece of infrastructure or an artifact of some sorts, or just to assassinate an enemy leader. The typical Dark Tide mission goes as follows. We can call the beginning the infiltration phase. You make your way towards the first key location where you usually have a standoff battle in some larger arena. You gather items and insert them somewhere or you wait until some hacking is done which always comes with this mini game. Fun at first but you do that way too often. Instead of the battle arenas, some missions also feature these investigations with uh, the help of a scanner and os packs. Then follows a travel section into the last battle, either a boss fight or again some hacking or some canister fetching, all the while hordes of enemies try to take you down. 
And then it's all ended with the exfiltration. Usually you just make your escape towards an elevator or some transport ship. It's fun, but personally, I would have wished for a little more variety. Particularly in higher difficulties, it is advisable to be a bit more tactical, use cover and explore the corners of the often winding levels. If you have teammates that are not super considerate of you, you will often find yourself scrambling for resources, ammo and health charges at healing stations. And this counts also for the crafting materials that you will find throughout the levels, something I will come back to later. Casual racism against psychos, I guess. Up until this point, I have mostly stated positive things about the game. It is incredibly fun to play. I love the setting, the gameplay is great, the banter between the characters is fun to listen to, top notch. For fans of Warhammer 40k, absolutely great. Even for those who don't like it that much, the setting, I mean, uh, the gameplay is just fun. The game excels when the teams work together and the missions run like a hot knife through butter. Here you have to insert canisters into a transport system, get them from the lower level to the mid-level platform. Your mate stands on the low level, throws you the canister, you catch it, thus avoiding a slow grind up the stairways through a horde of zombies. Together you work like a well-oiled machine, and amazingly that even worked with strangers for me. But there are aspects of the game I need to address. Where the lore is the good and the gameplay is the badass, the life service elements and the technical issues of Darktide are the ugly. And that brings us into the next segment, the grind of a life service. The annoying parts of the life service aspect vary. Some are a mild annoyance like a fly buzzing around you, others are straight up like sitting on a tack. In between missions, you are on board the Morning Star, a ship in orbit above the Hive City. From here, you start your missions. They come in various difficulty levels, with particular modifiers on top. These missions must be replayed multiple times to grind up your character's level. With this level, you unlock more difficult missions with newer enemies, but also more item slots to improve your character, new perks to choose from, and new shops to buy things from. Little hint, if you want to grind faster, choose the highest difficulty available in a low intensity engagement zone and try to stick close to your team to survive and to be of some use to them. That worked for me. High level missions also spawn more crafting materials. On board the Morning Star, you will not only find the training room, your teammates and the mission selection terminal, but also various stations to buy and upgrade gear. There is a shop in which you can buy gear with currency you earn by playing missions. And there is another shop where you can buy particularly good items with a currency you gain for completing very grindy weekly tasks. Finish 15 missions, kill 750 enemies of a particular kind, or pick up special items during a mission. These special items, like scriptures found during a mission, grant you bonus points for leveling up and some extra cash. They are often well hidden and block a slot which you could use for an ammo crate. A particularly rewarding thing to find are two grimoires. These give you bony in the end indeed, but you need to consider if it's worth searching for them. These dark artifacts of chaos do corrupt the players, draining their life away. But I guess it still beats what others go through to get their hands on a grimoire. Sorry, I fucked your husband. What the f- These shops don't have a continuous offering. In intervals, the weapons on offer change, so there's a tiny bit of FOMO. Fear of missing out is unfortunately something you will encounter in Darktide. You spot a great weapon, the stats of which are of course totally random, you buy it. Or do you hold out until there may be a better weapon in the shop? I mean, you only got so much cash. But you never know when that will be, when will the next best weapon come around? So you check the shop regularly, hoping there may be something good to buy. Or you spend your hard-earned cash on a mystery box and get total trash. Remember the crafting materials I mentioned? You race your teammates for those during missions. Between missions, you can use them to improve your weapons with blessings, granting small stat improvements. Upon writing this review, these crafting menus aren't even finished yet. 
some show coming soon, weeks after the game's launch. These very grindy mechanics are put on top an otherwise pretty good game. And for me, this is one of the reasons why Left 4 Dead is still the top game in this field. But at least they refrain from monetizing this game in a horrible way. Imagine you could buy XP points with real world money. That would be horrible. The monetization they did implement into this $40 game is still not that cool though. Yes, you can unlock cosmetics by playing the game, but by god, they are ugly. 40 different textures for this pair of pants. Amazing. If you want to look fancy like my character Prolaf Scholz, you better spend some cash. Let's say you want a set like this, and yeah, I bought the Steel Legion set. Shut up, I like the Steel Legion, they're cool. Just wait until they get a Death Corpse of Krieg outfit. Everyone will buy that. <sighs> Death Corpse, aren't they cool? <laughs> Fucking expensive though, you know what? While I'm recording, I just I just checked on the Forge World website. Ten of these figurines, they are now 64 euros. When I started collecting my Warhammer figurines, they were they were a lot cheaper. They were still expensive, but holy shit, this got so expensive. Where was I? Oh yeah, the set. This costs 2,400 Aquilas. You can buy 2,400 Aquilas for more than a quarter of the entire game price. By the way, they introduced this price class after players complained. Originally, you had to buy more Aquilas than you needed. Cheeky bastards. This cheeky monetization scheme, which has become a bit less cheeky now after players protested, is, in combination with some of the missing features which are slowly trickling in, in large part responsible for the mixed reviews on Steam. And from what it looks like, a large part of the people sharing negative reviews even agree with me that the core gameplay is amazing. It is just the life service aspects of this game that are stacked on top of the core gameplay that are the annoying bit. I mean, there's a reason why in between missions you're running around in third person. They wanted to make sure that you spend some time looking at your character and make sure that you are looking just as fancy as everyone else. It's not as on the nose as just plastering everything in posters advertising outfits, but it's still uh, a... Yeah. Take the hint. Spend money. It's that tiny voice in the back of your head reminding you that there are microtransactions to spend cash on. And you know what? Microtransactions, considering the game costs 40 euros and this outfit costs 11, the transaction isn't so micro. But hey, at least there's a way of looking a bit unique without spending money. The game does feature a character creation mode. A nice touch. Say hello to Eric Cartman. Isn't he fancy? If you messed up during this process, for a price, you can change almost anything. And man, some of those haircuts are an acquired taste. Onwards to another slightly ugly aspect. The game is based in Warhammer 40k lore, we established that. But the game also tries to tell its own little story with cutscenes. To be honest, I don't trust you. I don't think you've got the brains to handle any of this gear. The superiors talking to you in this little movies constantly remind you that you are garbage and you have to prove your worth to the Inquisitor, who is sometimes mentioned during the missions in banter between the player characters, but it rings rather hollow. In these scenes you also see other squads that do similar work to you, and apparently there is some sort of rivalry between everyone, but that doesn't really come across much. And in addition, there is a saboteur on board the ship, who is revealed to be your rival. Dun dun! Sensoria reports in the last 12 hours have uncovered unauthorized communication broadcasts aboard the ship. Someone on board the Morning Star is relaying information to the surface, to the enemy. There is a traitor among us. Everyone is a suspect. The traitor has at last been identified. Me. 
They play this up to be a big reveal, but I just sat there wondering, okay, who was that? The plot is incredibly uninteractive, and at no point is it relevant during the missions. Really, all the story this game needed was, you are an inquisitorial kill team, go and kill heretics. Darktide's own story is as elusive as the next issue. The game's inner machinations, they are an enigma. The guys from Fat Shark used their own proprietary engine for this game. Hats off to that. They put it to good use, the levels are a sight to behold. And veterans of the tabletop game can even spot a lot of terrain elements they maybe have at home on their gaming boards. These old Necromunda bulkheads are a recurring element. Very nice, I found a lot of stuff I own myself. The dedication to detail really shows in the different sections of the Hive City that have been built for this game. They mostly follow a heavy industrial setting or the typical Imperial Gothic setting that is so common for Warhammer 40k. And the game really gets that across. Even though the levels share one general design philosophy, they all have elements that set them apart from one another. Yes, there is some repetition that shows, especially because you have to replay the missions over and over again for the grind, but still, they do look good. Visually, this is pretty cool. There is even a feeling of exploration as different missions take place in the same parts of the city, but explore them from a different angle, different streets and hubs. Cynical people would call this simply content recycling. Shame on you if you dare to think that. This beauty has its dark side too. Yes, it looks incredibly lovely and very atmospheric. It would be all wonderful, but the game is very heavy on your hardware, often limiting you from enjoying all the beauty. It is GPU heavy. Running it on anything lower than a GTX 1070 may be a waste. Just have a look at this. Here I'm playing on high settings. Notice the massive lag. On medium settings I have a nearly constant 60 FPS, with the occasional massive dip. I can let the game run on lowest settings, with an uncapped FPS count reaching the morning star parked in orbit, but then the game just looks incredibly ugly. Between medium and high settings the difference isn't that much though, at least visually. Optimization wise it is massive, so medium settings is the way to go for me. If you are struggling to run a game like CSGO, then Darktide is definitely not for you. Optimization is not the game's strong side. It is not as bad as making the game unplayable, because the slow loading times seem to mostly affect the menu and the hub world, but it is still irritating having characters float around until they fully load in. A decent CPU and GPU in combination with an SSD should make the game run fine, if not dial down the amount of corpses a bit. Speaking of that, the game's gore is pretty decent. They implemented a few nice tricks to display wounds on bigger enemies. Nonetheless, the gore never reaches the levels of other comparable games, though it's still pretty fun to cut those uh, chaos cultists in half and let those maggots fly. And yeah, some of these enemies are so infested with blessings by the god of life, they're spewing maggots and other worms when you cut them apart. Well, I drifted off script there, so... Uh, it, back to the back to the performance. Occasional crashes happen. The game is shutting down entirely happens as well. I have gotten stuck on maps. Enemies pulled me into spawn closets and I couldn't escape anymore. I have fallen through the map on occasion and random disconnects happen too. The game is not perfect. One surprising thing though, on a positive note, I have played this game with people from the United States with practically no lag. When everything works as intended, Fat Shark has their servers in order. In the previous segment I very much praised the gameplay, but in the ugly section of the video I need to add one thing I hope will be rectified in the future. The absence of captivating endgame content. Once you reach the max level of 30 and have decent gear, there is nothing new to conquer. It is still the same missions you played during the long grind to the top. However, I am rather confident they will add more material in the future. Developer Fetchark invested a lot of their own money into this project. This is not just contract work by GW. No, they have a lot riding on this project. And with Warhammer being such a vast universe, with many things to pick from, I am confident they will find more material to add. I mean, we have not yet encountered a single Chaos Space Marine, let alone a proper demon. 
or a gene stealer cult, or elder, or orcs, I really hope to see more in the future. There is great potential. I mean, there's an Amazon show in the making revolving around an Inquisitor. That's great material to latch onto. And to slowly wind things down here, we are approaching half an hour. <laughs> Dark Tide is a great game with issues. It is still unfinished in some areas and not playable on older PCs. The grind is annoying at times and the game's own narrative explored in the cinematics is forgettable. But all that floats high above in orbit, above the actual game. Because once you get your boots on the ground, it is solid fun. Even with random players, it is nice. With friends, even better. But when all alone, don't count on the bots. If you are a fan of Left 4 Dead style games and find the over-the-top universe of Warhammer 40k appealing, then this game is for you. But due to the issues the game faces, I cannot give a general recommendation. It really hurts me to say this because I genuinely enjoy the game, but only the core gameplay. Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide is at its core a great game that is plagued by the life service game virus like so many games today. In-game monetization and lack of content on release. A great game with faults. Regardless of the verdict, I hope you enjoyed this video. It definitely took a long time to make. I spent over 80 hours playing the game. So if you value that time, then give this video a like, share your thoughts in the comment section down below and subscribe for future content. And if you absolutely love what we do here, why not support us on Patreon as our supporters there got to see this video well before anyone else. Our lovely supporters are Lone Wolf, Zed Gladys, Wrapped in Glass, Cookie, AX98, Theto, Rival556, Plasma, Tome, Rainbow Flash, Gris Livia, Strange Module, Cop Fighter, Inter, Child Spirit, Sir K, Ram Gilama, Zane, Whiskey, Christoph, MTD, Leggy Boy, Daniel, Freylem, Crony XS, Theo Vio, Imantrix, Armon Oziloko, and newly welcoming Rolling Rock and Sidonai. A gigantic thank you for your support. And now in the end that you heard all about the slightly bad optimization of this game, you know why I need to upgrade my graphics card. The, the 1070 just doesn't do it anymore if you want to play these uh, slightly more advanced games. Especially if you have to run recording software in the background. <laughs> For Counter-Strike it's absolutely enough though. So, see you guys next time. Until then, have a nice day and as always, goodbye and guten tag.